Hello again, everybody, and welcome to my podcast. It's called It's Good to Talk. People know me because I got the book out a couple of years ago, and that's what I'll start it. But my good friend, Stoney McGarn, it's also on audio, and Stoney also has a DVD out, Storytelling. I'm going to give you a sample of those in a few minutes, but then I'll chat to you more about that, and we'll give you a taste of what's on the DVD. My sponsors are Liffey Van Lines Moving Company here in New York City. They've been around since 1973. Big birthday this year coming up soon. On my last podcast, I did a lot of stuff about Mother Hubbard's, a restaurant I own in Ireland back in 1990 to 95. And I did two podcasts on that. And I have one more to do, which will be coming up in about a week or so. I sponsored a lot of charities. I first restaurant in Ireland put in wheelchair access before it was a planning requirement. I campaigned with other people from IWA Irish Wheelchair and all over the country to make it a planning requirement. All new buildings must have wheelchair access and ramps and wheelchair facilities. And I may happily say we were successful. So stop, don't pass Mother Hubbard's. So on my next podcast about that, I will talk about the countries we went to to promote awareness of wheelchair access and the need for it. The big thing with people in wheelchairs is the one big thing they hate, steps that no one likes steps but if you're in a wheelchair steps are an impediment so in 1992 we went to russia to moscow and leningrad st petersburg to create awareness and see what was going on there in the world of wheelchair 93 we went, we did cover jordan and israel and we were on the caribbean cruise in mexico and down south i'll talk chat about that too 97 1980 1998 1998 we were in malaysia and some good stories from malaysia as well about drama and things that happened in Malaysia. South Africa in 1999, and we went on from there, China in 2000, and Thailand in 2001. This was all creating awareness in these countries about wheelchair access, but also part of the fundraising. We were all volunteers, as many as 80 of us at times, small over Ireland, and that. And that all, that all tied into the whole Mother Hubbard story of sponsorship and other charities I supported. I see one here where I sponsor scholarships to Colosh to Dara, which is in Connemara, and a bunch of students from the Midlands. I was able happily to provide them with scholarships to go to the Gaelic and learn how to speak their native language, Australia Irish language. That'll be coming up about Mother Hubbard's. And I sold it myself. You can see a close up there of my sales brochure back in the day. And I'll talk about that too in advertising uh, business, how to sell it. But I will discuss menus. If you're a restaurant owner, you'll find it interesting how to build your menu from your walk-in box. Because that's where you hold your produce, chicken, breast, beef, whatever, how to make soups, fresh orange juice, carrot juice. Nothing should be wasted in the kitchen. Everything should be used and consumed. I had my own garden. I was fortunate enough to be able to grow vegetables and reduce my uh, purchasing power or, or purchasing expense. <clears throat> The good thing with that was it landed me on television and radio and into cookery books and all that, Eat Your Greens by Sophie Grigson. So we'll be bringing you updates on that. And other charities that I sponsored, Aware, which is deals with depression, uh, cystic fibrosis, and a whole list of them. And we'll chat all about that. But today, until I get to that podcast about all of that stuff, just to give you a sample of it, today I'm going to pull out three stories from Stoney's DVD for you to enjoy until we get to the next podcast, which will be in a week or so. I think I'm going to select Stoney's a very good storyteller. He was born in 1941. And I hope you learn something here because that's the whole idea of it's about to talk, it's good to talk, is about learning. So I see here, Stoney's going to give you the definition of bullshit, as he calls it. And I'm sure you'll find that enlightening. He's also going to talk about the son of Hickory Horace Tramp. And that's a story with kind of a subplot that you'll find interesting. And those then those of you that like cats, the last one here he's going to do is called The Cat in the Glass. So enjoy those. And until I see you again, remember, it's always good to talk and be kind to yourself and to your friends. And remember, you are Cat in the Glass. I'm John D. Healy. Good to talk. And that's how it all started. Get it on Amazon. When I bartended on the west side of Manhattan, there was a police lieutenant, John Flaherty, used to come in there every night and drink 7-Up. He was a good friend of the boss's, and he lived around the corner, and he had just retired. And the captain 
and lieutenants from the 2-4 precinct and some lieutenants from the 2-0 precinct used to come in and discuss cases that had gone on with him. And from what I understand, there's a big law book this size on every desk in, the pre in every precinct. And supposedly Flaherty knew it off by heart. He had a photographic mind. And I must say I found it very impressive. They would be discussing cases and he would get off the stool and he would stand up and he would do this and he would say, gentlemen, the case you are referring to is on page 1203, section B, and he would recite it as if he was reading it out of the book. Very impressive. He also knew two prof law professors from Columbia University, about two miles up the road. He had met them when he was a lieutenant on patrol, and they would come in a couple of times a year, always on New Year. And they would have a few drinks and he'd have his seven up and they would discuss law all night. John Flaherty would talk to anybody about anything. And one night he's talking to a guy that kept using the word bullshit. And Flaherty said to him, that word you're using a lot of, would you like to know the definition of bullshit? The guy said, what? He said, the word you're using a lot of, would you like to know the definition of it? The guy said, yeah, you tell me the definition. Well, says Flaherty, I have to explain. Back in the 1930s in New York City, and probably every other city in America, nobody cursed. The worst word you would hear was bullshit. And down in Hell's Kitchen on 9th Avenue in the 40s, a guy who lived up on the 6th floor, he had a 7-year-old son. And in the summertime, the 7-year-old son was playing with the 12 and 13-year-olds down on the corner. And every second word out of their mouth was bullshit this and bullshit that. And the kid, when he was thirsty, he would run up the six flights, go to the ice box, get some ice out, chop it up, go to the faucet, run water on it. That's how you cool down back then. The father is sitting on the couch, drinking Rupert beer. I understand it was a Manhattan beer. Listening to the Brooklyn Dodgers on the radio. No TV back then. And this is where it kind of goes into a rhyme. The kid asked the father what was bullshit. Father, tell me what is bullshit, asked this eager earnest lad. Son, replied the loving father, bullshit means both good and bad. And as a means of illustration, bullshit is the dung that's found in the limits of the stockyards where the cows and steers are bound. And as a means of fertilizer, lawns and gardens, you will find that this product of the stockyards has the elements beaten blind. But in barroom parlors, bullshit stands for something more. It's a sad to hear a sucker that imagines he is sore. For when a lady lacks in morals and tells you you are just it, take a hint, my boy, and listen. She is handing you pure bullshit. When I was a kid in Ireland, we used to hear a lot of talk about America. Well, it had the dollar. That was the big thing. But it also, we'd hear a lot of stuff about it had individual freedom. It had freedom of choice. And it had freedom for all. Then I came to America. And I had the good fortune to become an over-the-road tractor-trailer driver. And then I had the good fortune to get a black partner, Jimmy Reese from the South. And the reason I say good fortune is that a picture is worth a thousand words. 
He didn't tell me much in the beginning. And this was the 60s with the marching going on. And one Thursday, we're in uh, New Orleans. And we have a load going to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. We should have had no problem getting there Friday. But we ran into traffic. And Jimmy kept saying to me, we got to get in the gates before four o'clock. Otherwise, we're stuck until Monday morning. Well, we didn't make it. And we had to drive back to Fayetteville to a truck stop called the 401 truck stop. And when I went inside the truck stop area, there was three signs looking at me. The first sign was restaurant, white only. The second sign was TV room, white only. And the third sign was Beds, white only. So Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night, I ate in the restaurant, watched TV, and slept in a bed. Jimmy Reese, he ate in the kitchen. He slept in the truck with no air conditioning and listened to the radio. And Jimmy Reese was five generations American. And I was the foreigner. And I'm asking myself, did we get a little propaganda back in Ireland? What happened to the freedom for all? Jimmy used to tell me stories. His grandfather told him. Back when slavery was in full swing, the white plantation owners used to breed black people. They would get the strongest and finest 13-year-old boys and up, and they would get the strongest and finest 12, 13 and up girls, and they put them into a cabin as man and wife. And by the time they were 35, they would have 15, 18 kids to work the plantation. Then when slavery was abolished, the white plantation owners wouldn't feed them or pay them. And typical of some men, this could be black or white, they take off, leave the women with all the kids. And mother's love for their kids stuck it out and got food to feed their kids any way they could. And some of them turned to selling their body. And they would have code words to get into their cabin at night, which makes me say, we shouldn't be too quick to judge. We will never know what any one of us would do if the chips went down, what we will do to survive. And this is about one woman, she had 14 kids. And her code word was, Hillary Hollers Tramp. And when her kids became older, they put these words together for love for their mama. Oh, the path was deep and wide from footsteps leading to our cabin. Above the door there burned a scarlet lamp, and late at night a hand would knock, and there would stand a stranger. Yes, I'm the son of Hickory Holler's tramp. The corn was dry and the weeds were high when Daddy took drinking. Him and Lucy Walker, the up and ran away. Mama cried a silent tear, and then she promised for 
fifteen children. I swear you'll never see a hungry day. When Mama sacrificed her pride, the neighbors started talking. But we were much too young to understand the things they said. What mattered most of all to us was Mama's chicken dumplings and a good night kiss before we went to bed. Oh, the path was deep and wide from footsteps leading to our cabin. Above the door there burned a scarlet lamp, and late at night a hand would knock, and there would stand a stranger. Yes, I'm the son of Hickory Holler's tramp. When Daddy left and destitution came upon our family, not one neighbor volunteered to lend a helping hand. She let 'em gossip all the want. She loved us and she raised us. The proof. Is standing here a full-grown man. Last summer, Mama passed away and left the ones who loved her. Each and every one is grateful for their birth, and each and every Sunday she receives a big bouquet of. Fourteen roses with a card that reads, "The greatest mom on earth." Oh, the path was deep and wide from footsteps leading to our cabin. Above the door there burned a scarlet lamp, and late at night a hand would knock. And there would stand a stranger. Yes, I'm the son of Hickory Holler's tramp. Some weeks later, after we left Fayetteville, we were in a truck stop called the Cross the Border Truck Stop. In Jacksonville, Florida, we were there on a Sunday afternoon, and we were strolling in the big, big parking lot, and we see a group, a group of black people, with a guy entertaining them down the end, and we stroll down, and he said one I liked. He called it the Cat in the Glass, and an hour or so later, I meet him, and I asked him if he wouldn't mind saying it again. That I'd like to write it down, and what was beginning to really surprise me was the way black people were reacting to white people. Only a few days we were in Selma, Alabama, and I seen a young white woman making a black woman get off the sidewalk to get her walk by, and then you'd hear white guys. If they didn't know the black guy, they would say, "What are you doing here, nigger? Are you supposed to be here, nigger?" And I said to Jimmy, "I said, you know, if I was born black, I think I'd hate every white son of a bitch that ever was born." And Jimmy said, "Hold it!" He said, "You can't do that, baby." He said, "If you do that, he says you'll never live." And that's why we have the trailer there with the door on the side where we have our suits. When we're stuck on weekends, we have to go out and have good time. He says you can't keep the hate in, or then he says you'll build it up and you'll have no humor. And you gotta have humor when you meet the girls, you know. And when you meet the girls, if you have humor, you get pussy and you live good. And you gotta live. And the guy said to me, "Sure, baby." Get your pen and paper and get some writer's cramps, and this is it—the cat in the glass. 
when you get what you want in your struggle for self and the world calls you king for a day, just go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that cat has to say. That's you, baby. For it is in your father, your mother, husband or wife, whose judgment upon you must pass, the person whose verdict counts most in your life is the cat looking out from the glass. Some people may think you're a straight shooting chum and call you a wonderful guy, but the cat in the glass says you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. He's the one you must please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you right up to the end, and you have passed your most dangerous, difficult test if the cat in the glass is your friend. You may fool the whole world down that pathway through life and get claps on the back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartaches and tears if you have cheated the cat in the glass. Bon voyage, folks.